Hi, in this video you're going to see a cross-border trip on a German high-speed train, what it is like to travel on a Belgian intercity, and you're going to learn about some of the quirks of Germany's railway system. Welcome to Travelmentary TV. This time I'm in the city of Cologne in front of the main train station. What makes this place special is the location next to the Cologne Cathedral, which is always an impressive sight, isn't it? But why am I here? Well, I would like to show you a nice little railway adventure from western Germany to the Belgian coast. The trip consists of two parts. First, I'm going to board an international high-speed train operated by Deutsche Bahn in order to travel to Brussels, the Belgian capital. There, I will make a stop and get a night's sleep before continuing my journey to the town of Ostend, located at the North Sea. For that part of the itinerary, I'm going to use the services of the National Railway Company of Belgium. That means you will be able to see two very different travel products in one video. Anyway, let's enter the station building. Those of you that have been following this channel for a while have already seen this railway station, both before the pandemic as well as in the midst of it. When I recorded this video, the travel experience came pretty close to that before Corona. Shops and restaurants were open and you could really see how the travel industry was recovering. But after nearly two years of this pandemic, you know how things are. Rules change all the time and the video may not be representative of the situation when you are watching it. Anyway, this is the band launch. So, hello. The question that probably arises at this point is what kind of ticket I booked. Here's the detailed answer. I bought a ticket in first class in a rate called Flexpreis Europa and I did that on short notice. The features of the first class cabin as well as lounge access are part of it. Moreover, as the name of the raid suggests, it is also a flexible ticket, which would essentially allow me to take pretty much any other DB train to Brussels on the same day or the following day. Besides, you can make a stop on your way to your destination and then continue your trip later with another train. The lounge is clean and modern, but it seems that they have reduced the number of seats because of the pandemic. This becomes apparent when you watch my ICE International video about a trip to Amsterdam. Keep in mind though that this video here was recorded in August 2021 and the rules change rather quickly, so today it may look different again. As the lounge is located above the DB Travel Service Center, you have a nice view from up here. One of the features is the free Wi-Fi connection, which I'm testing here. What makes this lounge stand out in comparison with others is that you can get some warm snacks such as this panini here and the employees serve it to your place. That's quite uncommon at most railway lounges that I have visited so far. Ok, time to leave the lounge to go to the platform. Vielen Dank. Tschüss. If you wonder what that red card is about that I handed over to the employee, no, I didn't referee a game well in the lounge. The thing is, when I entered the lounge in the first place, I had to leave my personal details for corona tracking purposes. And on that occasion, I also got the red card, which I guess is to let the other employees in the lounge know that you are a legitimate visitor.
Before going to the platform, which is number 4 today, I'd like to show you the other end of this railway station. Basically, you can enter it the way you have seen earlier, from where the cathedral is, but there is also another entrance right here. That square is called Breslauer Platz. If you look at the upper right corner, you can spot a regional train waiting above the shops. I think that the footage shows that this is an important piece of transport infrastructure. And this impression is backed by passenger statistics. In 2019, before Corona, it handled over 300,000 passengers per day, making it the number 5 railway station in Germany. If you have watched some of my other videos, you have likely noticed several differences between railway travel in Germany and for instance in Italy or Spain. One of the things that instantly comes to my mind is the fact that there is no ticket or security control to get to the platforms. Anybody can enter them, not only passengers, but also people with bad intentions such as pickpockets. Moreover, the same platforms that serve long-distance high-speed trains also serve regional trains. And during peak hours, when people get home from work to the cities nearby, it can get rather crowded. There are two train sets that are disconnected here in Cologne. The one with the blue livery goes to Amsterdam, and the other one with the classic red DB design is my train for the trip to Brussels. It is an ICE3M made by the German industrial giant Siemens in collaboration with Bombardier. These trains are capable of using the railway infrastructure in Belgium and the Netherlands as well as in Germany. My coach came to a stop at the very end of the platform. Something that I always noticed there is the big gap between the train and the platform, which just looks somewhat daunting, especially when you try to get in there with a lot of baggage, so you better don't lose your balance. I don't think the cabin differs from the standard ICE 3 design. There is the usual 1-2 seat layout, the same colors, the same seats. Just as in the domestic Intercity Express trains, there is an overhead compartment where you can put your baggage. In addition to that, there are also baggage racks. And this is the seat that I reserved. An important thing to know is that DB has been in the process of redesigning the ICE 3 trains for a couple of years now. I assume that this includes the fleet of ICE 3 Ms too. The redesign, as well as the introduction of the ICE4, however, have faced an outrage by passengers and now DB is changing the seats in the redesigned trains as well as in the ICE4. So basically, they are redesigning the redesign now. This scene was filmed in a separate cabin with a total of 8 seats. You can find it just behind the workplace of the conductor. But as the train is moving into the other direction, his seat remained empty. We are leaving Cologne, so please allow me to introduce you to some information about this leg of the journey. For the trip to Brussels, we will need slightly less than two hours. In that time, we will cover a distance of 223 kilometers or 138 miles. On our way to Bruxelles-Midi train station, we will make three stops. 
Aachen, Liège und Brüssel nach. It doesn't take long to reach speeds up to 250 km per hour, which is the maximum on the Cologne Aachen high speed line. With that being said, just like on most other lines in Germany, not only high speed trains run on these rails, but also regional and cargo trains. Critics say that this makes the German railway system expensive to build, complex to operate and susceptible to delays. They also claim that travel times on the ICE are longer than on comparable railway services around the globe. In order to approach the truth, let's compare two similar routes in Germany and France. If you travel from Munich in southern Germany to Hamburg with an ICE, you will need 5 hours and 32 minutes for an airline distance of 611 kilometers. With 588 kilometers, the distance between Marseille and Paris is similar. The TGV in this comparison only needs 3 hours and 18 minutes, and that isn't even the quickest connection available. A non-stop train makes that journey in only 3 hours and 2 minutes. So the ICE makes 8 steps on its way to Hamburg main train station, while the TGV makes only 2 or even no steps at all. Now on the one hand, we could say, yes, the ICE takes longer, but in a very densely populated country as Germany, it is accessible to more people by making more steps. On the other hand, one could argue that not all steps that an ICE makes are a necessity. Instead, at least some of them are a result of Germany's federal system, where local politicians try to influence the way high-speed railway lines are constructed and operated. Why else would an intercity express step in a town like Donauwörth, which has a population of less than 20,000 people and a train station that handles a total of around 10,000 passengers per day? Remember, the most important stations in Germany have a ridership that goes beyond 300,000 passengers, daily that is. Now let's go back to the actual trip again and the amenities on board. So we have a tray table here, which is stable enough to put a standard laptop computer on it. A power socket can be found below the seat. Moreover, we have a reading light, which can be switched on and off with this little button above the seat. And in case you think you have too much sunlight, those window shades will help you. The seat back can be reclined a little bit, but that's always difficult to show on video. Moreover, I did a noise measurement with unsurprising results. We have already reached our first step, which is Aachen main train station. Here I decided to stick my head out of the door. This railway station, by the way, was opened in 1905. From here it's just around 5 kilometers to Belgian soil. The Dutch border is also nearby. Okay everyone, let me continue in 35 seconds.
you're going to make another step at liege guillemin which is a spectacular railway station. The Spanish architect, Santiago Calatrava, was also the mastermind behind Lyon's Saint-Exupéry TGV station, as well as Lisbon's Oriente station. Okay, we are leaving Liege, and from here we go straight to Brussels. This whole railway line is part of an international effort that started with the name PBKA. Those letters stand for the cities that the project connects with high-speed railway infrastructure. Its origins go back to the 80s of the last century, when Germany, France and Belgium first discussed the idea of bullet trains operating between Paris, Brussels and Cologne. Later, the Netherlands joined this effort. Over the years, more and more high-speed sections were completed to make this what it is today an alternative to the plane. A disappointment was the fact that the Wi-Fi connection that is usually good on the ICE didn't work this time. But who needs to surf the internet anyway when looking out of the window comes with this marvelous scenery after a rainstorm. Well, let's get some coffee now. Normally, in first class, there is service to the seat and the train attendant goes around and collects orders. This time, that's not the case and I don't know why. So let me just go to the onboard bistro instead. That way you can also get an impression of the actual size of such a train. A standard ICE3 has a total length of somewhere around 200 meters. As you can see here, there are not only carriages with the usual seat configuration that DB refers to as Großraumwagen, but you can also choose to sit in a compartment. Here I'm entering the second class coaches, which have a 2x2 two two seat configuration. I believe it is fair to say that the difference between those two onboard products isn't that big. I have reached the onboard bistro. You can sit down in this area and have a variety of snacks and even warm meals. If you go a bit further, you can find the counter where they sell all of that. Hello, uh, can I have was bestell? Ah, super. Um, then I'll take a coffee. Coffee is no hot drink. Unfortunately, it turned out that they wouldn't serve any coffee, so I took a Coke instead, along with an apple cake and a bottle of juice. The service to the seat is kind of limited, so I had to take the bottles to the seat myself, but the cake on the other hand was served by one of the employees. So I think the service concept is not really coherent, is it? And with a price tag of 10 euro and 50 cents, things aren't as cheap as on the Polish train that I tested in the previous video. Besides, the presentation of things is not the way I like it to be. Instead of handing out wooden spoons and forks, just to appear environmentally friendly, why not use cutlery made of metal? And why not provide a conventional plate? Many questions arise when you look at this rather sad way of presenting a meal. I must say, I'm not impressed by the approach that DB takes here. To me, it looks like cost-cutting under the guise of eco-friendliness. But please tell me your opinion on that in the comment section below. And also, please feel free to share some of your travel stories with Deutsche Bahn. When we look out of the window, we can see the city of Leuven, and soon we will reach Brussels capital region, which is one of three regions that form the Kingdom of Belgium, with Wallonia that we have passed earlier, and the Flemish region being the other two. Before our arrival in Brussels, let's do a quick lavatory check. Here in Brussels, both French and Dutch are official languages. And in fact, Belgium is an interesting place in that regard, because German also has an official status. 
That doesn't mean, though, that everything is love, peace and harmony in that country. In fact, there are certain political tensions, especially between the French-speaking and the Dutch-speaking part. By the way, many institutions of the European Union are headquartered in Brussels. That's why it is often referred to as the capital of the EU. With the arrival in Brussels, I have completed the first part of this itinerary. From here I will rely on the Belgian railway services. Let me share my general thoughts on the trip so far. I must say that I always enjoy traveling on those international high-speed railway lines. It is fascinating and a special experience to board the train in Cologne. And after a rather short time, you are in a different country. And I think it's good that there's not just the TARDIS serving these routes, but the ICE as well. With that being said, I would like to see certain changes to DB's product. Having traveled a lot on Italian high-speed trains, I'm always dreaming about a more luxurious cabin on the ICE. And maybe even an entirely different concept on international trains. Please tell me your opinion in the comment section below. Do you think the first class product is good enough? Here I'm buying a public transport ticket in order to get to my hotel. That process is pretty straightforward and a single ride costs 2 euro and 60 cents. And I must say the public transport system is really a winner in most large European cities. You don't need a car to get wherever you want to go. And Brussels is no exception in that regard. Anyway, let me transform myself right to the hotel that I have booked. It is located not far from the Royal Palace. The courtyard by Marriott Brussels EU is a four-star hotel with a decent rating on Google. I paid 128 euro and 43 cents per night, including breakfast. Just so you get an idea of how much things here in Belgium cost. After a night in the midst of EU institutions, I continued my journey towards the Belgian coast. First, I had to use the metro once again, and this time you actually get to see it, because I didn't forget to film it. This station is called Arlois. It is rather modern in its design. The Brussels metro has a total of 59 stations and a system length of 39.9 kilometers. Back in 2013, more than 138 million people used the metro. So I would argue it is a vital part of the public transport system of this city. The metro of Brussels was built after the Second World War. It all started as an underground tramway and then in 1976 the first metro line was completed. Today there are four metro and three pre-metro lines. Ok, we have arrived at Bruxelles Midi railway station again, I must say, because that is where the first leg of the trip had ended the day before. I will show you around a little bit and give some background information about this place. Just like Cologne main station, this is not just a train stop. There is a lot more to see and to do here. In a way it is similar to an airport. You have plenty of shops in here, including a grocery store that is open throughout the week. By the way, I filmed this store when I made a different trip, and I did so in the afternoon, which explains why in this footage certain products like bread appear to be already sold out. Anyway, I think it's really good that you can buy all necessary things in here. That can be quite important for travelers, right?
Well, and this is one of the entrances to the station. It looks modern and clean from that perspective, but don't let that fool you. The station also has some corners that aren't nice, and I suggest that just like at any station, you better guard your belongings. In the train station, there are a lot of places where you can get some food. Here, for example, I got myself two slices of pizza. Bonjour, uh, la même chose pour moi aussi. Ça? Ah, oui. uh. So, what do you think about this railway station? Have you ever been to Brussels? Once again, feel free to share your stories in the comment section below. Personally, I would rate this station with solid three stars, but that's obviously a subjective verdict. Anyway, let's not forget that I'm here for a trip, so now it's time to buy my ticket to Ostend. There are those ticket machines, but if you need some help, I think you can also buy them over the counter at the SNCB office at the station. Once again I purchased a ticket in first class and I got some sort of weekend rate, so I ended up paying 28 euro and 20 cents for a round trip, which is actually 50% less than the regular rate. With regard to the first class product, you're going to see later what it is like and whether it is worth the money or not. I noticed that the actual ticket is printed with a slight delay. And those papers here are just the receipts, so you might want to keep an eye on that. Let's go upstairs to the platform now and catch our train. The double-decker railway carriages were manufactured by Alstom in Bombardier, and this type is called M6. The locomotive, on the other hand, that propels this train, is made by Siemens and belongs to the Series 18, which is basically a Eurosprinter ES2007. <laughs> so as I'm boarding the train and going through the railway coaches, you can first catch a glimpse of the second-class cabin. As I mentioned, these carriages have two levels and therefore offer an increased capacity. Personally, I have to say that the modern and clean appearance of the cabin surprised me in a way. It looks like the second-class cabin is a good product to travel with. And here you can see that on the upper level we have the first-class cabin. But it's really only a small fraction of the train, because I guess that with the really convincing second-class product, the demand for it isn't so big. Let's test it anyway and see what it's like. The first thing that one can notice is that there is also a 2x2 seat configuration in first class, and I occupied the only single seat. So that's something I wouldn't have expected. On most other trains that I have seen around the globe so far, first class comes with a 2-1 configuration. As we are leaving Brussels, I would like to give you the main facts about this part of my journey. So we will need roughly 1 hour and 10 minutes for a distance of about 70 miles. On our way to Ostend, we will make two stops. Let's use this trip to talk a little bit about the Belgian railway system and how it developed. Seen from a historical perspective, this country has played an important role in making trains a transport option both for people and cargo. It was Belgium, after all, that built the first railway in continental Europe. It went into service in 1835. In the 1930s, it operated the fastest steam engine powered train on this planet, which could achieve top speeds of 114 km per hour on the route that I am traveling on in this video. More recently, the Belgian railway was divided into three business units in order to comply with EU regulations, a topic that I have already touched in several other videos. Now the Belgian state controls SNCB as the train operator, HR Rail as the human resources branch, 
and Infrabil, which is responsible for the infrastructure. SNCB itself is a business with over 19,000 employees and a revenue of over 2 billion euro. Each year, more than 240 million passengers use the services of the Belgian railways. That means that passenger numbers have more than doubled over the past 20 years. Now back to this trip again. So we have left Brussels capital region and we are heading further north into the Dutch-speaking part of Belgium. By the way, I would like to point out that the seats here come with power sockets. However, Wi-Fi was not available on this train. There aren't that many cabin amenities anyway, apart from this tray table, this reading light and the window shades. Shortly before our first step, we reached an area of bad weather, which made filming rather difficult. And in the following scene, we are arriving in the city of Ghent. It is famous for medieval architecture. Back then, around 1300 AD, this place became a rich and important mercantile city. But now let's enjoy the landscape and towns that we are passing. I'll be back in 40 seconds. This is our second step, the town of Bruges. Some of you may know it from a dark humor movie starring Colin Farrell. Again it is an ancient town that due to its strategic location became an important trading point, especially from the 12th to the 15th century. And it is said that here in Bruges the world's first stock exchange was established. And that was back in 1309, so over 700 years ago. At this point we need another 15 minutes or so to reach our final destination. As this trip is coming to an end, what is the main takeaway from this video? Well, first and foremost, I wanted to show that the railway system in Europe allows you to make trips to a lot of destinations, even to smaller cities, without using the car. There are different layers of transport options that you can use instead. For instance, you can hop on a high-speed train, make a cross-border trip with it and later change to an intercity train, then to a regional train and finally you can complete your trip with the municipal public transport system. Yes, sometimes things differ from this ideal picture and there are reasons for criticism. But all in all, it works, at least when we are talking about medium size and big cities. So, why not choose the train the next time you want to travel somewhere? Okay everyone, we have reached Ostend with its beautiful old station building. There used to be some long distance connections, for instance trains to Vienna. And until 2015, Ostend was also served by the Thales. From 2013 to 2017, the station was refurbished and this roof structure was added. All of that was part of a 150 million euro project to redevelop the area around the station. The English coast, by the way, is located less than 70 miles from here. Before the Channel Tunnel was opened, there were many ferries from here to the UK. This town is also famous for its beach. Well, that's it for this time. I hope you enjoyed this trip report and please don't forget about the four noble deeds which are commenting, sharing, liking and subscribing. I wish you a great day wherever you're watching.